this Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on Wednesday, August the 13th in the year 2008 here at the park in Golf Mill. Uh, it's a retirement uh, home. Um, my name is Neil O'Shea, and I'm a member of the reference staff at the Niles Public Library. And I'm honored again to be speaking today with Mr. Saul Schatz. And Mr. Schatz and I first sat down uh, last September the 11th. And at that meeting, we accomplished the copying and scanning of his um, war album uh, documenting his 30 missions flown from England over Europe, uh, for which he was decorated. Uh, and this uh, valuable um, album we now have uh, copied, uh, and it contains Mr. Schatz's comments on the missions, as well as how they were reported uh, in the Stars and Stripes newspaper. Um, so we're going to start uh, part two of the interview as it is today. Now, Mr. Schatz has already been interviewed at a different time. Um, but his album was not included uh, in the file that was uh, compiled by Betsy Talstead at the Evanston Rockford Vet Center. But he does have a file already on uh, in the Library of Congress in Washington, and we will be uh, sending them a copy of the interview also and a copy of the wartime album uh, to add to the Sal Schatz collection. Um, anyway, uh, Mr. Schatz was born on October the 4th, 1919. So Mr. Schatz, we have a series of questions here which we generally follow in speaking with our veterans. Um, the first question is, when, when did you enter the service? I was inducted July 7th, 1941. About six, seven months before D Day, or rather uh, Pearl Harbor. Were you drafted or no? I was drafted. Really? Yes. I had that letter from our president said greetings, and that was it. So you were actually drafted before Pearl Harbor? Yes, I was. And then were you in, how were you in regard to schooling at that time? Uh, no, I was working at a um, drug company in the city of Chicago. And I thought when I was drafted that they would send me to the medics. When my shipping orders came through, they were going to send me to Fort Riley, Kansas, which at that time was a second cavalry or horse outfit. And I'm looking at it and born and raised in Chicago. What do I know about a horse? So I went down to the recruiting officer, took a discharge and a three-year enlistment at the Air Force. You were able to do that at that time? At that time, I could do it, yes. So, how did everybody in the family feel about your being well, in, were they when working? I told my dad I enlisted, he went right through the ceiling, you know, screaming that I'd be out in a year's time, but I said, Pa, we'll be at war before my year's over. And sure you knew that? I just felt it. I just felt that we would, we be, uh, would be pulled into it, and six months later, yeah. Where did you go to high school, if I may ask? Uh, I went to Crane Tech. So you were on the west side then? Yes, I lived on the west side. Lawndale or? Uh, in that area. Yeah. Um, I'm one of those that, uh, like, in a way, fell through the cracks. I never completed uh, grammar school, or rather never graduated from grammar school. At the time, I was going to attend grammar school, which was a sixth grade school. In the sixth grade, went to Herzl for junior high school. I was in ninth grade when they closed the junior high school, so I went right on to Crane. And they graduated there in 1936. So uh, I enlisted in the Air Force. And what, you, any reason why you chose the Air Force, say, perhaps, and not the Navy? Yeah. Well, I was already in service. So. You know, they discharged me with one hand and then ducked All right, you were still within the Army by going from the Cavalry to the Air Corps. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just felt that the Air Corps was a better branch. Yeah. So were you living at home at that time then? And, uh, yes. Yeah. I was at home from 
Fort Sheridan, they sent me to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis for basic training. How did you find basic training? It was a farce. They were, they just took over, the Air Force just took over the base and every, almost every week there was another row of tents going up and they had, all we did was march from the tent area to the mess hall and back three times a day and that was basic for six weeks. I suppose basic training changed as the when the war came in earnest. I, I believe it has. Yeah. As far as I was concerned, I have never handled a weapon, never, uh, never drilled or went on these uh, 25 mile hikes or anything like that. But you must have been in pretty good shape at the time, though. Yeah. Oh yes, I was in good physical shape. Yeah. And from there, from. Jefferson Barracks, we went to Chinook Field for uh, airplane mechanics. That's here in, in Illinois, isn't it? Yes, yeah. right near, near Champaign. Uh, we, uh, let's see, we completed our schooling in January, February of 42. Uh, and from there I was sent to uh, Greenville, Mississippi which was a uh, basic training base for cadets. There I became a uh, instructor in the school. And uh, let's see, in, in August of 42, my wife came down, or my future wife came down when we got married. And uh, let's see, I was in training. So so if it weren't for the war, you might have been you might have gotten married later. Maybe. Maybe. But, um, actually, if I had never volunteered for gunnery school, I probably would have spent the entire time in service down in Mississippi. Instructing. Yes. Or later, when I went, I was transferred to Greenwood, Mississippi. I became uh, on this one squadron the. Um, Mechanic on the uh, cable controls of the planes, which were B-13As. B-13s, mm -hmm. yeah. So why did you volunteer for gunnery school? It sounded good. They made it look so enticing. You got wings. You got the extra pay. Uh, you got the uh, additional stripes. So. Uh, Was that a decision that you discussed with your family or your your wife? Just no. my wife. And what did she think? Yeah. She she didn't know any difference. It sounded good to her too. So uh, I volunteered for it, took another physical and passed it. And uh, from Greenwood, Mississippi, uh, beginning of uh, June, I was sent to uh, Fort Myers, Florida for gunnery school. We were there for six weeks when we uh, completed our schooling and then let's see, we were put on the troop train and sent on to our next uh, to our phase of our training. We were sent to Fort Salt Lake City, Utah. There we were either sent to B-24 or B-17 training. So at this, at this time you're a, you're you're a, you have a stripe. What what is your? Uh, I was a uh, I was still a buck sergeant. Sergeant. Yeah. And I never got that stripe. And then your, was your wife? Did she trail around the country with you at certain times? Most of the places, yes. So she you were they like in um, enlisted men's family quarters or something or? No, no, we lived off base when she was there. Whatever uh, camp I was at. So you had to find lodgings for, lodging your, for her and pay for it out of your army pay, or yeah. That's right. Uh, at Fort Myers, Florida. Let's see. Yeah, we finished our schooling there, and from there went to Salt Lake City, Boise, Idaho, where we were put on crews. That's where I yeah. wound up with my crew that uh, we have my album with. Yeah. And we were sent to Casper, Wyoming for face training. Um, we were part of what they call the Cecil Isbell group. Cecil Isbell? Yes. He was a colonel 
if he was a big football player with the Air Force or with the Army. Uh, okay. Um, well, uh, while we were at uh, Wyoming, my wife came out there. We were together during our training. Uh, when we completed our training, she went home. Our crew was sent to Topeka, Kansas, where we were supposed to pick up our own plane to fly overseas. But being part of the um, crazy setup of the Army, they only had seven Ps on that base, so they split our crew up with half of one plane and half of the other, and the uh, Army Transport Command flew us overseas. So you you go overseas, I think you mentioned you arrive in England around November of 43, yeah. and you had enlisted in 41. June or July of 41. Right. So that's two years later then. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you'd seen a good bit of the country by then. Uh, yes. And probably met a lot of different people than you perhaps had met before. Yes. From, well, from Topeka, Kansas, we flew to Syracuse, New York, Presque Isle, Maine, then up to Gander Lake, Gander Lake, Newfoundland, and then we jumped overseas, flew over, landed in Presswick, Scotland. We got there, I, I don't know the exact date, it was just before Thanksgiving of 43. And then uh, how did you all feel about going overseas, getting into the action. We didn't know. We didn't we know. We had absolutely no, no idea, idea what we were getting into. And uh, it was also new, it was being in a foreign country all of a sudden, and uh, foreign money, and uh, things are so different. Yeah. Uh, from Scotland, they sent us to a, um, a base called Tring, T-R-I-N-G. Uh, oh, some, maybe an hour train ride up north of uh, London. And uh, then they, we were replacement crews, as different bases needed more crews. We were sent to different bases. Our crew was sent to the 448th Bomb Group, and we replaced the crew that was shut down. And uh, we went into operation um, that's the first mission date there. Yeah, it's great to have this album. We can just mm -hmm. check out mission number one, February the 5th, 1944. This was our Tour of France, yeah. Mm -hmm. You write here, I was very nervous on my first mission. Yes. We were scared, got an idea of uh, some of the things that uh, we were getting into. We started to realize what was going on. And, uh, and at that very first mission, you were attacked by a Fokka wolf, right? 190s? Yes. They hit the plane uh, in, the, in the wing position with us. Uh, it was the uh, Mary Michelle. We later flew that plane on a mission. And that was the, uh, if we can digress, when that plane came back from being uh, rebuilt, we flew it on its uh, first mission, and it never flew combat again. For the simple reason, it was burning too much gas. So they just took that plane out of uh, service. Um, so when you came back from that first mission, that must have been a, oh man, what do we get into now? Right. <laughs> but being trained, this is what we were going to do, and that's what we were going to do, and we did it. So you were part of the 8th Air Force? Yeah, the yeah. 148th Bomb Group was part of the 8th Air Force. And the 8th Air Force is famous for all this uh, strategic bombing in, in, uh, in over Europe. German assets in Europe, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see from my uh, album that uh, we get a lot of bases in uh, Germany, uh, airfields, uh, Component parts factories, uh, wherever they sent us, that's where we went. 
So did you have any um, casualties in your unit or your crew? No. We were the the most luckiest crew on the field. We were the only crew that started and finished as a full crew without anybody getting the Purple Heart. And why was that, do you think? Well, just, it really was luck? We just said God had his hand on our shoulder. Because there wasn't a mission that we went on. They'd come back with holes all over the plane from uh, any aircraft uh, attacks. So even though you were a talented crew and skilled, it still was beyond, it, uh, circumstances were beyond the ability to be controlled by, uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah there well. were a few missions that I can recall, I don't remember the exact sequence, but uh, that one mission, they had an airplane, we were flying out of wing position, they had a box there with the anti-aircraft, and suddenly the other wing uh, gunners screamed out, hey look, and their one shot on their ship was shot down, which was had a commanding officer in it. Did yeah. they all die then? That no, if I recall, we counted four, five shoots, and the others went with the plane. So that meant they lost three men then, or how about no, they lost five? Five, ten people in the crew. I mm -hmm. see. Yeah. That now you, when you were on these missions, you had a harness yes. that you'd attach the parachute to. Right. And on the harness there was then something. On the harness you had two little packs. One pack was they called escape kit, carried a map of Germany and France, German money and French money, in case you bailed out and was fortunate enough not to get captured. The other packet was with morphine and other medication in case you got wounded and used it until you got back to the base. Uh, one other mission, we went on a, um, the only time we went on three ship formations, we went after what we call the ski sites or the uh, launching pads of the V-2 rockets. Wow. Our bombers started out in the, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. We were going to be in France five minutes and then out. And on that bomb run, our lead ship was shot down and we never dropped our bombs. We just kept going and went back to the base with the bombs. We weren't going to make a 360 and go back. Did you ever have to serve as the lead ship? What? We, we, was your plane ever... No, we were never a lead ship. We were always either a, a wing or the diamond position. And we always carried the um, aerial cameras. So we were always taking the pictures of bombs away, bomb strikes, and uh, then whatever we saw on the way in or out that we thought would be interesting to the intelligence, we would take pictures of it. So was there a crew member charged with taking photographs, or did the film usually just run out of... No, it was a, usually a ball turret cover that uh, he would lean out of the back uh, 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 door, hatch door, he would take pictures of whatever seemed uh, appropriate. With a, he'd hold the camera? Hold the camera? Yep, just hold the camera out there and take pictures. I'd have to hold him so he wouldn't fall out. And other times when he was in the ball, I would take pictures out of the waste window. So you were a waste gunner and... Most of the time. Most of and also a tail gunner. Also tail, yes. And were those like, help me out, what millimeter were those? Oh, all the guns were 30 millimeters. 30 millimeters. No, 50 millimeters. 50 millimeters. All the like guns. Two, two barrels or? Uh, no, waste guns were single guns. The tail or the turret guns were twins, twin 50s. Either the top of ball turret or the nose or tail turret. Did it affect your hearing at all, firing the guns? I think so. That's why I got hearing aids. And. Uh, I did uh, freeze my cheeks and ears in the uh, cold weather. You know, the cuts from the oxygen mass just froze in my cheeks. And, uh, that's where they came up with that uh, uh, wind chill factor. 
when they opened up the Bombay, you got that wish going right past. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so we, uh, I think we were warmer while we were flying in that stream cold than we were on the ground because of the clothing that we wore. So you were, um, you'd fly a mission, say, today, mm -hmm. then you'd have like a day off? Usually. And then the next day? Next day. And were you able Weather to... Permitting. Were you able to relax or not really? Yeah, sort of amount, yes. Sort of amount. Yeah. Most of the time, we come back from a mission, just go into the bed and go to sleep. Yeah. You know. And uh, there was, uh, that part was an idiosyncrasy that somehow it just involved. The mornings they may woke us up for a mission, we just get out of bed and get dressed and leave. We'd never make our bed. Our reasoning was if we made the bed, we'd never come back to it. So every mission, we never made our bed. And, uh, so you flew the 30 missions then from February through maybe the end of May, beginning June, just, uh, June 2nd was just prior to, mission. in a way, to D-Day, yeah. Four days before D-Day. But you had no idea that uh, D-Day was no. in the offing, no? We had no idea until the night before that that was D-Day coming up. And, uh, it was something. We, we wanted to go. We were considered as qualified observers, but they wouldn't let us. So said, no, you made your missions, you stay on the ground. So that was the rule. If you make your 30 missions, yes. you complete your you required through, service. You were through through. Flying combat. Yeah. Actually, when I started, we only were supposed to make 25, but... Uh, but our 18th mission, the uh, General Doolittle convinced the Surgeon General to increase an additional five missions. I guess the by that time we weren't seeing many fighters. We were mostly our attached uh, were the uh, anti-aircraft guns, yeah. and they were they, 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 those Germans were good. I swear they could pick a flea off the nose star at 20,000 feet. They were that good. You yeah. know, I had a, I interviewed a veteran not too long ago, and he said that, but he, he was injured in, in 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 infantry, and he said the Germans could put a shell in your back pocket. He, he, they were that good, I swear. They, we never went on a mission and came back without finding holes all over the plane. Just that we were lucky and never hit any vital part of the plane, like some of the others. Uh, I don't think I ever went on one that we didn't lose at least one or two crews. Uh, and how many planes would be going out at a time? Generally, uh, if you call for a full uh, mission, you'd have four, 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 sixteen, and two wings. That's what, 32 planes on, on a uh, mission. Uh, we had, uh, there were three groups in one wing. And generally, lead group, at least the lead group would carry uh, the general purpose bombs, either 500 or 1,000 pounders. The second group would carry incendiaries. And the third group would carry uh, anti personnel bombs. So you blow the place up, burn it down, and then get anybody running around. And your plane usually would. Depending defended. on our position, either first or second group or third group. Oh. But mostly we were for either first or second, carrying general purpose or incendiary bombs. So did you fly at night or in Just the day? All our missions were daytime. And did. But the pilot, or your your lieutenant, or your pilot, he didn't know what the mission was until until briefing. Uh, we would know to it briefing. They would uh, tell us. But uh, you rarely never were you were going the day before or the night before. Yeah. It was at the briefings when they would tell us where. And so they, you knew you were saying there that you knew that the United States was going to war. I had that feeling. Yes. When did you know that America was going to win the war? 
I was going to be successful. We just felt that way from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Very beginning. Even though we were being pushed back, we just felt that uh, we would uh, we would beat them. We did. We thank God our country uh, mobilized and built the uh, necessary equipment. Yeah. And to be able to project that power across two oceans, it's just, yes. it's hard it's to... Uh, hard to, uh, to picture. Yeah. But, uh, near the end of my tour, I was on a few of those thousand plane raids that the Air Force was able to send out over a thousand planes in one raid. I talked to men that were still you know, on the ground, and they said he just saw wave after wave after wave of planes going over. Uh, I think the worst mission that the Air Force went on was the raid at Schweinfurt, the ball bearing plant. And we, we incurred our biggest loss of planes that day. We, our group went on that mission, but our crew, as we hit the coastline of France, we blew the uh, hydraulic system, so we aborted, so we missed that mission. And the Air Force lost by uh, something like 20 or 30 planes that day. And they were actually talking of uh, night bombing, but they stayed to it, the daylight bombing. We bombed during the day, British bombed at night. I, I should know this, but why did the British bomb at night? Be, why, why did they go at night? Was I don't it easier were, or they harder? Were trained, I don't think they were training? trained for day flying. There was a difference in the type of flying. They, uh, night flying, they flew single formation, single one and back at each other. And they bombed mostly the big cities. They never went for any... Uh, plants or uh, things like we did. We went after the component parts factory, tank, tank factories, uh, the airfields, the uh, marshalling yards, but uh, they never bombed any Pacific item like we did. Maybe they wanted uh, Just, revenge for London or Coventry or something. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, we flew strictly days in formation flying and uh, and once the um, Air Force were able to give the fighter planes the extra range with the belly tanks, then we got complete uh, protection all the way into the target area and back. And uh, so then we rarely, rarely ever saw any uh, fighter attacks. As I said, it was almost all uh, anti-aircraft uh, attacks after that. So you're B-24 yeah. carrying this crew of 10 yeah. and these various types of bombs. What was your range? How far could you fly into I Europe? don't think there was any place in Germany that we couldn't hit. And get home. And come back, yes. We had the full range of, uh, of all of Europe with the B-24 and uh, actually 17 had it, but I don't think they went as far as we did. We were, uh, we carried a bigger bomb load, we carried, uh, we went in further than they did, faster. We went in after them and came out before them. We you got an R&R &R furlough when you were in England to go yes. up to Edinburgh. We went up to Edinburgh for six, uh, six or eight days. Where did Edinburgh. that occur in your... About the middle of our tour. About the middle of the 15, 15, 15. Summers around 15, 16 missions. Yeah. And, uh, that's a yeah, wonderful time. Do you develop a taste for Scotch whiskey, or you, or not? Uh, or? You know, I was never much of a drinker. Yeah. And, uh, one drink would be more than enough, or mm -hmm. one beer would be more than enough for yeah. me. And, uh, except for when we made our last mission, we got drunk for three days, and and that was uh, let's see, we that was about the fifth of. Uh, June, we were in uh, how did they get a town near us? Not seeing uh, the main city of uh, Norwich. And as we were walking down the street, we 
walked past this one church and the boys stopped and we looked at each other and we all just walked right in and sat down and prayed. Thank God that we were alive and ready to go home. After we walked, when we walked out, I asked the boys just what kind of a service was it? And none of them knew because we walked into a Church of England, which is, I guess, different than all the other types of uh, what the Episcopalian or whatever. And, uh, all six of us, I think, were de all uh, of a different denomination. But we got along pretty good. And as of this date, this interview, God has taken its toll. My pilot and I are the only two left alive out of the ten. Is that Mr. Thornton? Yeah. yeah. L.B. Thornton and I are about the, are the only two left alive. Yeah. I do stay in touch with them. I talk to them maybe once or twice, three times a year. Do you remember any particularly humorous or unusual events? Uh, On the missions? Or while you were in... Uh, well, like I said, uh, that we never made our beds. That's interesting. Well, uh, one of the other things, uh, this other crew, one of the boys got a, a packet of, um, I guess, vegetables or something to, to grow. And he set up a, uh, a garden, planted all these, uh, whatever he had, and uh, was taking care of it. And unfortunately, that crew got shut down. The next crew moved in, and one of them took over the uh, pl the garden. And uh, about a month later, they got shut down. Ooh. The crew came in, and nobody would touch it. Yeah. No way. That was bad luck. So. And was that crew shut down? I no. I think they were still there when we left. The. Uh, and like I said, they uh, they took those, uh, I, which I have pictures of the the enlistment that were left alive. Yeah. And completed a cure, made a base defense unit out of us. And we don't now you were, yeah, that's interesting. Um, that you didn't have to fly over Europe anymore, but they they thought we would de be able to defend the base if, if the Germans sent over paratroopers to attack the bases. And we told them we had no training for that. In no way are we ever going to go after a seasoned paratrooper when you never had no training. Yeah. You, know, so you couldn't teach us enough in, in a week's time to be able to be effective. So uh, it wasn't much after that uh, that uh, they sent us back to the States. Yeah, so then, um, yeah. I think it mentions here that um, your service ended in September of 1945. Yes. So when did you come back to the... We landed in Boston August the 1st of 1944. Oh. So. Was that by ship you came back? Yes. We came back on the, uh, the West Point, which was, uh, I believe, almost as big as the uh, Queen's. Mary. Yeah. And it was an empty plane, a uh, ship. Boy, it must have been a great feeling to come oh. come back and all you did your, your job. That's another thing you about got all these medals and citations. And that was another thing about our wonderful army. Before we got on the boat, they gave us leggings, they gave us gas masks, and they gave us helmets. Now, what the heck were we going to do with all of that on the ship? And once we got out into the middle of the ocean, all you had to do is watch the back of the plane, of the ship. There you saw all the hemel, hemel helmets, the, uh, the gas mask, the leggings. It was from overboard. We don't want them. And uh, they gave us, there were so few on the, pl on the ship, that they gave us all uh, jobs to do. More or less like uh, guards who can't go to a certain place for smoking and things like that. So they fed us three meals a day. <laughs> we eat three meals a day. Yeah. 
Did you gain weight when you were in service or stay yes. the same? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm actually, as far as I was concerned, uh, the Army was a very sedate life. Uh, like I said, we never marched, we never drilled, so it was up to you to stay in shape. Yeah. So you land in Boston, then you get a train back to... To uh, Fort Sheridan. And that's where you're... No, we weren't discharged. We got a, a, uh, a furlough, and then from there I was sent to uh, Santa Monica, California for R&R. &R. Uh, the Air Force had taken over the uh, Miramar Hotel there, and just the fellows like me that were coming back were sent there. I was there with my wife for two weeks. and. Uh, then I was reassigned to Walla Walla, Washington to train new crews. And I spent the rest of the war up there training new crews. For B-20? On uh, B-24s, yes. So, and, uh, you, were, you, you, you were there then when they dropped the bomb on for, Japan? Yes, I was there for the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So some of those crews you trained, they fortunately never had to they went overseas. I don't know what, what happened. Yeah. yeah. We never stayed in contact with any of those crews and which way they went, whether they went to uh, Pacific or Europe. But uh, after their training, that they went on to, uh, like we did, to overseas. Yeah. So you were, um, your final rank was, was um, Staff Sergeant. Yes. Where did you receive that promotion? In, in England? I, I got that staff in, in Europe, yeah, yeah, in England. I should have gotten my staff when I completed gunnery school. And they, they never gave it to us. And I just didn't do any big fight or arguing over yeah. it. And just went along with the flu. So um, what was it like? Um, Adjusting to civilian life back in Chicago. Yeah, a little difficult at first, you know. But uh, actually, I was discharged at uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, because I had my wife out there and discharged us and drove back to, to Chicago. You drove back because your wife had driven out, or you had bought a car? Yeah, or? yeah I bought a car. We had. What kind of car did you buy? I bought a Chevy. Was it a good one? Yeah. <laughs> but it was transportation in those yeah. days. Let's see, we're 1940, about a 38 or 39 Chevy. And uh, because of the type of work I was doing up there in Washington, I had no set hours. Like one morning I would maybe go up at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning, maybe the next day. Uh, at eight or nine at night for night uh, flying, or even earlier in the morning. So uh, I had unlimited gas, and uh, we had our ration books for meat and things like that. So we had a nice little apartment up there in Washington. It wasn't a bad uh, uh, way of life. We took it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Did the did the Air Force or the Army? Um did they ask you to consider staying on and make it a career? Oh, yes. They had asked us to, no, not to stay in, but to join the reserves. And uh, I told the uh, recruiting officer at that time that all I wanted was another piece of paper like the first one, the first pair of discharge papers. And if you ever needed us, you'll come and get us. And I think we are lucky in that respect because the reserves are called up for uh, Korea. And I yeah. think uh, four and a half years was enough. Yeah. I think I did my share. Yeah. Were you an only son or? Uh, yes. Oh, your parents must have been thrilled to see you home. Son. Yeah. The only one to go. Yeah. And uh, of all my friends, I think I was the only one that saw actual combat. Yeah. yeah. Was it easy for you to get your old job back or? I never went back to it. Did you use the GI Bill or? To one respect. Uh, we used the GI Bill to uh, buy a, our first uh, co-op under the GI Bill with 4% interest. And that got us started in buying 
wherever we lived. Did you go back into the drug business, the drug no, business? No, I got back in, I got into the uh, taxi cab business, which, uh, I don't know, but, uh, yeah, my father-in-law was a driver for checker cab company, and I started driving checker just before the uh, Cubs won the World Series, you know, it, uh, didn't win the World they played in it, and uh, from there, uh, I went to uh, independent uh, cab ownership and uh, so the cab business until I retired and I wound up having a little fleet of about uh, seven cabs, sold them and retired. And here I am at the park, retirement of my yeah. old age. Mr. Schatz, how do you think your military service and experiences uh, in the armed forces affected your life? Well, that's a tough one. In a way, it's so, it's so unusual, so different that even if after 60 years, you still talk about your days in service. And I still say, if you take it with a grain of salt, it's uh, it's uh, something to learn. It's an experience you just never uh, finish going through. You know, there's. The good parts, the bad parts. Uh, uh, I mentioned that I was an instructor in Greenville, Mississippi. That was the softest job I had in the Army. I was an instructor at cadet school and worked four hours a week. Period. And you gave it up? Well, uh, yes. You, know, you felt that we weren't doing anything. You know? That's why one of the reasons I uh, volunteered for gunnery school. Yeah. Had you ever flown in an airplane before you joined the Army Air Corps? No. Never went up before. Wow. Never before. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was fun. Like, especially when I was working on the planes in Greenwood, Mississippi. After you completed the work, like replacing some of the control cables, you had to have a... Um, one of the pilot instructors take the plane up to test and make sure that the plane was good for a cadet to fly. And when they'd come and you would help them get in the plane or get ready and he'd look at us and or he'd look at me and he says, You ever go up before? And you'd look at him and say, No, sir, never been up before. He says, Go get a shoot and get back here and go get a shoot and go up with him. And that was fun. Yeah. They get away from the base and they start making all these rolls and flips and turns and hey, you're looking up and there's the ground above yeah. you. Oh, that was fun. And you thought it was fun. Yeah, you must have because you I volunteered to go gunnery. Always, yeah. always, always told them, no, and sir, never went up before. I have never been in a plane. I just fixed them. And he hey, you come get a shoot and fly with us. And, oh, we loved it. I loved it. Yeah. It never affected me. I mean, I never got sick or anything like that. So you 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 say you've never been up, and you had they give you more yeah, experiences they, to get to get up there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they were single engine two seater planes, and uh, once they got away from the base, they did all kind of ac acrobats in it. And, yeah. yeah. Like I said, it was fun. And the same way at. Um, in our last few weeks of gunnery school, they would take us up in a uh, plane and we'd go out over the uh, bay and practice shooting at tow targets. And all of these pilots were putting in for overseas combat to flying and uh, they just wouldn't send them. And they, and they were so bored with their job. And, and coming back from uh, uh, Shooting out of the bay, they play with pit pet toe with the toe plane and uh, things like that. Uh, well, you're standing in the back and you notify your pilot that you're through shooting, and before you give you a chance to sit down and buckle up, they shoot, take it off, you know. But you know, you're young and full of. Vigor and whatever you want to call it. Vinegar and, yeah, yeah. And 
you, you got it. You, you, if you took it like I said with a grain of salt, it was great. Yeah. Mr. Schatz, how do you think your military experience uh, has influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? Military is great, but as the leaders, the right now with what we went through in Vietnam and what we're doing right now, I, I would blow our, our president's head off. This is the most foolish and stupid thing he ever pulled. We, we are looking right now at Vietnam all over again. There's no way that we can come out ahead. You know? I, I would venture to say that the um, GIs that are in Iraq or, or right now or Afghanistan are doing a lot of good with the people. I mean, we're that type of a country that the people want to help wherever you're at. And uh, I'm sure that they're, they're helping the kids, uh, giving them whatever they have in the way of food or clothing or getting clothing from home to give to the kids that they uh, have met and seen and helping uh, families uh, survive and whatever they can do to help. I mean, we're that type of people. But the country on a whole of what they're doing over there is not doing any good. What are we doing over there? What are we gaining? Is what I've seen what we did in England, what we did with the kids and the and I mean we're a GI that way. Yeah. No. We're we are people of a lot of compassion. And uh, like I say, this is a way of life that uh, we live for four, four and a half, five years. And uh, like I say, uh, we took it with a grain of salt. A grain of salt. Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in the interview? I can't think of anything. And then, of course, your your album speaks volumes, I, so we appreciate I feel that. What it is. Yeah. It, it involved uh, into something I knew I never knew we that the wife and I put together, but um, I think it uh, might uh, be nice for uh, researching it, either at the Library of Congress or the original. This original book I would eventually send to the um, uh, Jewish War Veterans Museum in oh, uh, Washington. Definitely. And let them put it on display and uh, let the, in future years, uh, those that want to research what happened during the Second War, they might have a copy of what somebody did in the Air Force. And, uh, I think it's the most complete record we have that any vet has mm -hmm. shared with us in the way of kind of organized memorabilia and documents. I Thank you very much. I appreciate that the feel, and uh, I'm glad that we were able to get together and do it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Shatz. Mm -hmm. So uh, at any future time, whatever you need, uh, like I said, uh, our bus does there on a Thursday now. Yeah, so yeah. how long does it drop you off for? I think they're giving us about two hours time there. Oh. So that's more than enough for whatever you might need yeah. to Okay. Okay, so uh -huh. um, um I mean I could I could zip up here but if it's if, if it would be convenient for you and your, we can talk about it, but but if it would be convenient for you and your wife then I, we can in do a that. way, I think I might like it. it. It would be a way of getting out of here. Being out again. Getting away for a, a, an hour yeah. or two. You know. Sure, sure. Uh, like yesterday, I took the bus and went to Walgreens. And, uh, yeah. I, the crazy thing, my electric razor, the head wore out. So I went to Walgreens and... I thought they had the bright uh, head, new head for it. 
and I got home and it won't fit. No. Wrong one. So I went back yesterday and returned it, and uh, they didn't they didn't have the type of head for my razor. Yeah. But for the same price that they charged me for a new head for this old razor, I bought a new one. Yeah. So I got a brand new razor for thirty. You know, it's funny when you you, you talk about the, your razor, you know, yeah. and then of course I think of you, the pictures of you in World War II. You've always had a mustache. Yes. My wife has never met me without her mustache. Yeah. She's never seen me without. Me. So you must have grown in like the first time when you were like 18 or 17 or something. Or I started growing in, in, the, in the school, yeah. 16. I think I was about 16 when I graduated high school. Yeah. I was a little on the young side. Uh, I don't know if I started early, but I know that I I went to, through uh, summer school about three, about three or four years, made yeah. up a I think about a year or two years of school. At Crane, um, mm -hmm. you obviously, obviously got a very good education. Uh, I hope I did. Were you, would any of your coursework or classes no. have led you to believe that you have this mechanical aptitude or this ability to teach or instruct or operate no. machinery under pressure or anything like that? No. 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 Never. When I took the general courses that the school had to give, you know, uh, machine shop and uh, pattern making, and uh, but uh, I never, uh, I don't think it, it trained me for anything special. Yeah, I think Crane Tech at that time had a Cracker Jack uh, um, ROTC military I rifle squad. Did. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, I remember I was a young kid. Um, I mentioned to my dad, I thought I'd like to join the uh, Boy Scouts. And he almost beat my head off. He said, no kid of mine is going to wear a uniform. And even he even felt then that Boy Scouts was a uniform. And who would think that I would wear one for four years? Four yeah. and a half years. And uh, I don't know, I, I think I had a premonition that uh, we would we would go to war. Yeah. You know? Although Roosevelt was talking that we're neutral and uh, but uh, who knows what would made the Japanese uh, want to attack us? Huh? I don't know. I, I could never figure it out. Well, I think that was. Um, I, mean, I guess the interview is over now, but um, I th I think as they look back, that was kind of almost once. Well, the the Japanese were marauding in China. And yes. and the FDR and then I think they're going to trade restrictions, embargo oil or whatnot. So the, the Japanese felt they had to do something. Well, but then who would have thought they would have uh, done it in such a way? Mm -hmm. well, I don't know. Maybe they were just spreading their wings uh, the way they were attacking uh, China. And I guess that's such a country you'll never be able to conquer them. Well, yeah, and of course they they were. Uh, the Japanese, uh, I mean, they beat the Russo-Japanese War. They, they they did a pretty good job in that, so they were yeah. feeling pretty pretty confident. Yeah, well, they, well, well at that time, the Russians were the Tsar. They weren't yeah. the very effective, I don't think, because uh, so you talk to a lot of the people here, and they they mention that their brother or their dad. Uh, Ran away from Russia to get away from the uh, Tsar and yeah. get into the army. And yeah. I remember my dad mentioning he had a brother. I guess he was uh, uh, how's the word? Uh, conscripted into the Russian army, and uh, it's uh, it wasn't the, the type of life most people really. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't think. Uh, but uh, I don't think we we're military people until you get our hackles up and then we, we do a pretty good job, a job if they let us. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, and that's another stupid thing that um, my, my personal feeling was. Like during uh, the Korea and Vietnam, there were so 
few, let me be frank about it, so few of our Jewish boys that went into service. Uh, as long as you were going to college, they, they didn't touch you. Yeah, you had to defer it, yeah. Right? Well, we were affluent enough to send our kids to college. So, so few of ours went, to, went into service. It wasn't like the Second War. It was a popular war. It was, everybody was going home about yeah. it. And uh, if you weren't being drafted, you were running down and joining up. Yeah. And uh, it was different. Uh, it was a popular war. You were fighting against a, uh, a, a dictator that uh, was killing people. And you had to go. You had to fight them. Not yeah. like in Korea or Vietnam. Yeah. You know, it was a poor man's war. So uh, I, I I don't know what else to say about it. It's yeah. just, uh, oh, thank you, Mr. Shaxan. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. Now,